Binge the full week of The Ray Taylor Show ad free over at inspireddisorder.com slash plus. This is The Ray Taylor Show. The Midnight Club, Season 1, Episode 2, The Two Danas. Uh, if this is your first time checking out the show, I will be spoiling this episode. So if you don't want to be spoiled on Episode 2 of The Midnight Club, I'd highly recommend checking out the series. It is an amazing series, and I will be breaking down every single episode in this show. So with that said, you have been warned. Let's get into this episode. Uh, this episode has a lot of drama. There are There's some friction going on uh, at Brightcliff with Ilanka and Anya, obviously. Uh, Ilanka is new to Brightcliff, uh, sharing a room with Anya. Anya being the Irish spitfire that she is. Uh, waking up, seeing that Elanka is making some teas, the the f- pungent smell of uh, different herbs and spices that Elanka is making this these different types of teas with different herbal remedies, and she's you know she's getting some static from a- a- Anya. Anya is you know in a lot of ways very protective of the people that are there. Uh, But also, you know, not easy to welcome new people in at the same time. Uh, So in this episode, we have Alonka kind of uh, exploring not only new remedies, but also trying to find out more information on Julia Jane, who was the girl with the same type of cancer that Alonka had, uh, was mysteriously cured. Uh, she told the story in the first episode of uh, to kind of introduce herself to the club, uh, the story about Jane and her being miraculously cured. And she's trying to do more research on that and also trying to find out more about uh, Paragon, which was a cult that also used that same house uh, back in the day. Uh, Alanka in this episode exploring the grounds. We get to see the outside of Brightcliff. Uh, she, we meet a new character in this episode as well, uh, Shasta. While Alanka is out collecting water from one of the springs that runs through the property, uh, there is a kind of like a hippie naturalist uh, person named Shasta uh, who was in Mike Flanagan's previous show. The Midnight Mass, she played uh, Miss Keen, which is, is awesome to see her in this show. She plays Shasta, who is a neighbor to Brightcliff and also uh, likes to roam the grounds collecting different herbs and using the spring water to make her teas. She runs a little business uh, out of her place there that's near that. She also uh, lets Alonka know that there is a vortex of healing. She's she's very positive to Alonka in general. So we get to see her going around, investigating the grounds, getting water, uh, talking about Alonka specifically. Uh, she's all. We also see her snooping in the office after uh, the the Midnight Club gets together. Afterwards, she goes to try and break into the office where Kevin. Uh, gives her a hand and opens the door because the door wasn't even locked. She's trying to find paperwork on Julia Jane, which the the leader of the uh, the Brightcliff, Doctor Stanton, kind of playing as if she doesn't remember this girl that was miraculously cured. Kind of, you know, kind of playing it off like, oh yeah. Well, that happens sometimes. People, people are misdiagnosed, which could be the case. I mean, we don't know f- for sure that Julia Jane actually had some miraculous cure why she disappeared. It could very well be that she was misdiagnosed, uh, but that's definitely the story that Miss that Doctor Stanton is is giving Alonka. So. Not really happy with that answer and wanting to know more, because clearly she's not giving her much information, uh, breaks into her office. Not really breaks in. The door was unlocked, and Kevin Kevin helping her out. Uh, and then after that, breaking in, she has a, another kind of a vision where she's 
basically in old timey bright cliff like the the visually the the cinematography is very much of a vintage old timey look uh playing like old timey record uh you have kind of the vignetting and and light flickering that you would have on like an older projector and uh she's transported she's having visions of a time far far before with uh bright cliff and of course she has her visions she's seeing uh the old lady again she's seeing um somebody she sees like a painting on the wall right so she breaks into the office finds a file on on jane uh on uh what's her face uh julia jane finds the file and as she leaves right they they hear somebody her and kevin they hear somebody uh, and kevin kind of distracts for her uh, acts like he's not feeling well and he was looking for one of the nurses and intercom wasn't working, right, to kind of distract from the situation so Alonka could get away. And that's when she starts having this vision of old-timey Brightcliff. And on the wall is a painting of someone that looks like Dr. Stanton, right? Looks like her as a painting on this wall. So I don't know what that means. Maybe, I mean, it is her family's home, so maybe... You know, it's her grandma. Who know? It is a vision as well. So maybe it's not actually of the past. But she sees this painting and she goes to touch it. And there's like a bubbling that's happening to the painting as she's going to touch the painting. And the, the bubbling explodes and all these, uh, these spiders come crawling out of the painting. And then she sees an old lady. And... Uh, she goes to, she screams, and it, it turns out, like, she comes to at, at the current time, and it's Kevin. So the old lady just kind of turned into Kevin as she comes to. So who knows what that connection is, you know? Maybe it's just the fact that anybody was there. She was visualizing this old lady who she's visualized before, along with the old man. Old man didn't show up in this vision. But either way, uh, that's kind of Olanka's aspect of this episode, right? Still trying to go get into alternative uh, remedies, which is kind of one of the big points of Bright Cliff. Like people go to not only to transition on their own terms, uh, but also to receive uh, test treatments. And, of course, they're open to do whatever they want. So, you know, getting in. She's very smart. So investigating new kinds of teas. She's There's a specific tea that she's making, but kind of tweaks on her own, improves it on her own, which, of course, uh, Anya doesn't really appreciate or respect her. Her desires to do that, of course, Anya very bitter. But that's pretty much Alonka in this episode, right? And kind of, like, throughout this episode, because she's getting shit from Anya, there's also a scene where everybody's folding these origami cranes. And we find out in that scene, uh, Spence cuts his hand. And we she finds out that Spence has AIDS. And Alonka's reaction to that is something that, again, sets Anya off to give her shit. It's like... In defense of how different people with AIDS are treated versus people with cancer, how, especially in the 90s, where somebody who has AIDS is demonized, especially by religious people, demonized and told that they deserve, that is their punishment for their quote-unquote lifestyle, right? For, for being gay or being into drugs or whatever, as if that's like... That's justification. Like God gave them AIDS as punishment versus how people with cancer are and how, you know, people generally are com treated completely differently. And Anya very defensive about that with how Alonka kind of reacts. I mean, it's not much. It's definitely more Anya taking any opportunity to trash Alonka, right? Any opportunity. So she's kind of having a rough day, and she finds out later from Kevin and also 
I think Spence was in the room, that actually Anya was very similar to Ilanka when she first showed up. She was into teas. She was into wearing wigs. She was into praying. She was into doing all of the things. And clearly, as time went on, as people died, as other people who were trying similar things died, she became more bitter. She became more jaded. And now, because of those things, she attacks other people for trying to have those same types of false hopes in some ways that she did. Also, she was pointed out uh Anya's pointed out when she goes to seek out more morphine because she ran out of morphine she's got a bit of a morphine habit trying to get more morphine from Kevin and uh Spence um she kind of gets put in her place like being a bitch to Alonka as well as how she is probably acting in that way because of the story Alonka told of somebody who actually did potentially get cured there was some miraculous cure that happened potentially right either that happened or misdiagnosis either way so part of herself hates the fact that 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 hates part of herself that still has that kind of hope that that a miracle can happen and because of that she's she's acting out even more uh, in this episode, obviously, I said that we meet Shasta, so a new character. Nobody else has seen her. It didn't seem like that character was imaginary, right? It didn't feel like Alonka was having a vision when she was out in the woods. Uh, but nobody else has seen her, although who knows how often the other people of Brightcliff actually go and walk around the grounds of Brightcliff. Uh, whereas Alonka out foraging for for herbs and and different things and collecting the spring water, uh, she was out there in order to run into her. And he, she's somebody Shasta, somebody that obviously she's into like the healing type stuff, natural remedies, collecting the spring water. She talks about how she's traveled all over the world to the, these different places that are supposed to having supposed to have different healing properties. And she says that this is a place that has the greatest uh, power, the greatest amount of healing potential. Uh, she talks about a vortex. She talks about how Alonka's this has a lot of bright. She's very bright. She's got a, like a, a good aura to her. Uh, so on some level, almost feels manipulative in some ways, just how she's showering Alonka with these this praise and you know telling her how brilliant she is and she barely knows her i mean the fact that alonka is out collecting herbs and things like that definitely means that she's open to different things but it's not necessarily proof of her intelligence which of course she is intelligent we know that because we the first episode we saw how intelligent she was not only being second in her class out of 900 graduating early uh but also I mean, even in this episode, she t- when in talking to Kevin, she wants she wanted to set some things straight while talking to Kevin that she didn't want to come off. She didn't mean to come off in telling her story in the last episode that, you know, she's searching for some mystical cure or whatever. Uh, and she doesn't want to come off as somebody who's foolish or naive. Right. She wants to make sure that people know that she is. And I think part of that is also just her trying to make sure she doesn't run away with false hopes, that she wants to make sure that whatever information she does collect or, you know, paths she may go down to hopefully rid herself of the cancer that she has, that she wants to maintain like her you know maintain being level-headed scientific logical she doesn't want to get swept up in any kind of magical stuff she wants to you know maintain clarity so we get to meet uh shasta which is interesting uh but a lot of this in addition to alanka who obviously is kind of the main character of this show so far at least season one 
this is very much an episode about Anya. About Anya, we get to know about her, how she was when she first got to Brightcliff, how she was very similar to Ilanka, experimenting with different herbal remedies, experimenting with faith and prayer, and trying to, you know, wearing wigs in an effort to, you know, and wearing makeup in an effort to look like somebody who isn't sick, you know, trying to put on the the face of somebody who is hopeful for a cure hopeful to get better and how different she is today right the person that i actually like you know anya my favorite character i love that bitter shit talking but also like brutally honest that's kind of one of my my biggest like character traits that i i like is somebody who's able to be brutally honest and not like and not willing to let their honesty be changed in any way in order to be nice like they don't mind offending on some level in order to speak the truth whereas some people will gladly go along with somebody's delusion just to make them feel better just to not cause any kind of trauma or turmoil or friction they will just go along with whatever delusion that that suits a person whereas Anya is more than willing to speak her mind which I appreciate and we see that not only when she wakes up in the morning uh, and Alanka's telling her about this tea that she's made she brings it up again during the group therapy where she's kind of talking shit. But you also see, even though Anya kind of attacking her during the group ther- therapy, we see Alonka able to play it off, right? She, Anya's going on and on about her old roommate and all the different things that her roommate did, ending with urine therapy, which I've heard of. I've never heard of somebody actually injecting urine, but... Definitely, like, Leo de Machida, well-known MMA fighter, is somebody that's a big proponent of urine therapy uh, as far as drinking their urine. Uh, I've definitely heard of, like, people who bathe or urine enemas, uh, but not injecting. But she's, you know, going on and on about all these things that her old roommate had tried in order to find some miracle cure and kind of putting all that on Alonka and Alonka has the wherewithal to kind of roll with it on some way clearly hurts her but like she is like okay so you're not into the tea but like you're a maybe on the urine right she's able to kind of play it off uh and even despite that after the group meeting you see Alonka throwing away all of her herbs which is kind of disappointing uh, and and uh, them kind of coming to some kind of truce in some way. You know, that's the thing. That's also the thing I love about jaded, brutally honest characters like Anya is that once you find that gooey center, once you find, once you get past all of their barriers and walls... Like, that's a person that will kill for you. That's a person that will, if they let you in, will, you know, will travel the ends of the earth to avenge your death, you know? That's the kind of person. So it's like that kind of characteristic you see where Alonka's trying to get through to Anya on some way, and, uh, you know, it's just tough. It's tough. And, it, you know, it seems like some of those barriers are coming down a bit with Anya in this one. Uh, So you see not only her Anya giving Alonka a bunch of crap, you also see her in defense of Spence. Like you see how she is so defensive about everybody else is there as well. Like when Spence cuts his hand and Alonka's reaction to finding out he has AIDS and the the kind of brutal cutting like don't you do that don't you pity whatever like 
the way he is treated in society is the most disgusting thing where, you know, all of that stuff I said before. So you, it, it's not only her attacking on some level Alanka, sometimes unfairly, maybe being a little bit too much. But also in that scene, you're seeing how just how much she loves and d will defend all of those people that are there that are already part that she's already let into let in past her walls you know which i appreciate that let's take a little break from the show to promote if you sign up for inspired disorder plus for one year specifically you get a free painting so a year subscription of inspired disorder plus is fifty dollars the painting the majority of them are a hundred dollars so it's a hundred and fifty dollar value signing up for one year of inspired disorder plus so not only do you get a free painting but you also are subscribed to plus for a year which means that you can binge this show the ray taylor show ad free the full week ad free available on monday you also get discounts that are members only pricing type of deals all of the podcasts that i've produced in the past close to 20 different podcasts i've produced hundreds of episodes there's also my personal blog you can ask me anything if you want to start podcasting or get into art all of that stuff available in addition to a free painting when you sign up to one year subscription of inspired disorder plus head on over to inspireddisorder.com slash plus and become an Inspired Disorder Plus member today. And now let's get back to the show. You also see uh, Dr. Stanton has like a little talk with her after the group chat. And, and she's talking about how her son was a lot like her. And how Dr. Stanton l like really has affection for people who remind, them, remind her of herself when she was young. And and Anya thinks that maybe she's talking about Alonka, but actually she's talking about Anya. That Anya reminds Doctor Stant of when she was young, just way tougher, which is true. You know, even Kevin and them say that like she's experienced a lot of death. You know, probably more than we're even aware of before she even got here. She's probably experienced it. Like she's somebody that's had a hard life. And that also is probably a contributing factor to why she is the way she is. But yeah, a lot of people, you see, like, the people have respect for her, but also don't have a problem reminding Anya that she was not much different than Alanka was when she got here and that she's just, you know, she's been on her path. She's longer and kind of been that the illusion of miracles has kind of gone away but she has that conversation with dr uh dr stanton and it kind of you know kind of puts her in her place a little bit or at least you know shows her that that people see why she's doing what she's doing and can understand what she's doing but also letting her know that maybe she's going a little bit too far. And then after the doctor leaves, you, she, she starts seeing a shadow move around, right? Because this one of the as, one of the the scary aspects of the show is these shadows that kind of shift and move and float around. And she sees a shadow kind of float around into the bathroom, and she sees a figure like a silhouette almost, like the bathroom's super dark. There's like a silhouette with like these glowing eyes and it scares her, right? She, she like, I think she probably hits the reverse on her chair and bangs like r reverses into the chest. Either way, she's startled by seeing this, this uh, shadowy silhouette in the bathroom with glowing eyes. And and then, you know, cut back to the bathroom and you can actually see in there and the shadow is gone, the light, the silhouette's gone, the figure is gone. But obviously scary. And then before the club, when everybody's kind of getting ready to go, people's alarms are going off at like 11.55 uh, and Alonka's getting ready to go, packing up her tea and whatever. She hears that Anya is in the bathroom throwing up. Throwing up, you know, 
easily could be from her illness also could easily be from her morphine habit either way she tells Alonka, i'll meet you in there don't worry about it you know so it's still like Alonka still has compassion for her obviously and you know you see anya kind of beaten down physically like you you kind of see that you know she's she's strong but she's she's definitely like everybody else dying they're all dying you know they're all very sick they're on a lot of medication and even in this episode we see kevin kevin's like a little bit here and there like at one point he's on the phone with his if with his family and clearly making up lies about running two miles and feeling great like he's kevin's really putting on a a facade of still being healthy probably so that his family doesn't worry about him so just little bits of kevin he's not a big part of it obviously we see him interacting with uh Anya a couple times kind of reminding her how she used to be and then also we see Kevin helping out Alonka when she's trying to break in and kind of showing her that oh the door's just unlocked you can just walk in so not a whole lot with with Kevin in this episode uh Amish we see a little bit that during group therapy they're talking about the things that they're grieving uh that they they're sad that they won't be able to experience or be able to experience anymore uh, because of their impending doom. Uh, and Amish is talking about, as he always does, his love of video games. He's talking about how the PlayStation 1 is coming out and that it's a, it's on a CD, so it's kind of like Sega CD, but no cartridges are needed. Uh, and that he's bummed that it's he's probably not going to get able to play it and how the GameCube's not even going to come out till next year. And he's like, so he's mostly bummed over his not being able to play these vi- new vi- new generation video game systems that are coming out which i remember that time when it was big when video game systems went from cartridges to CDs with PlayStation that was a big time like PlayStation was a game changer pardon the pun uh in a lot of ways and for Amish who is in love with video games makes sense that that's the thing he would he's upset about we also find out that he has a bucket list he calls it something else i think uh, before i die list and on that list obviously they do the paper cranes he uh natsuki told him about if you fold a thousand paper cranes origami not paper planes uh, paper cranes if you fold a thousand paper cranes the gods will bless you or something like that uh, which is something that he found out that day. And uh, Natsuki instantly regretted telling him. Uh, but also on his list of things, of his bucket list, in addition to the cranes, which he's not even making all of the cranes. Everybody's helping out, aside from Sherry. He also has a video game that he's making that he wants to finish before he dies. Obviously, finish making this video game. He wants to lose his virginity. He wants to, I think, skydive or, or something like that. And also wants to attend his sister's wedding. Kevin has belief that he can lose his virginity while parachuting into his sister's wedding. Like, really, really trying to knock off multiple items on his bucket list at the same time. That's... That's the mindset Kevin has going into helping his buddy Amish out, uh, trying to get those things. But everybody's positive. Amish is a great guy. And, uh, you know, they're all there helping while they're folding these paper airplanes, except for Sherry, like I said, who she's like somebody who definitely doesn't participate. Not only is she not participating in the folding of the cranes, she's just providing the ambiance, providing the music, which is fine. And also, during the club, she hasn't shared a story yet. So she is definitely... And also, she definitely puts people at a distance, right? She's not sharing. She's not participating. She does share during uh, the group therapy where she's grieving uh, these pets that she had. uh, That one was named after MacGyver. 
or Her Henry D. D Dean, I forget actually that actor's name, but MacGyver, the guy that played MacGyver. Um, and Anya's trying to call her out, like tr trying to pay attention to see if what she's saying is a lie. Because that's another thing about Sh Cherie, is that not participating in some ways, or participating in her own way, uh, you know, not telling stories during club, but telling stories in general, as in pathological liar. Like, nobody can really put a finger on who she is, what her family's like, families, you know, all, all that stuff. So, interesting character. Keeps people at a distance in a lot of ways, or at least on her terms. Um, Spence, we see... Obviously, when he cuts his hand, freaks out. Uh, everybody else is pretty calm. Uh, we find out that Spence has AIDS when he's getting his hand stitched up by Mark. Uh, Mark is trying to, you know, just keep his head, trying to keep him from freaking out. It's like, I'm wearing these gloves to protect you, not to protect me. I'm doing all of these things so that I don't infect your cut, not that I'm worried about you infecting me with AIDS. Like, he's trying to dispel a lot of the misinformation that was just like flooded around the AIDS crisis which you know I remember that I mean it's amazing how medical mi disinformation is a hallmark of this country and how usually conservatives will use that to demonize marginalized groups at every opportunity right any opportunity for them to demonize a marginalized group they will take it regardless of its basis in reality or truth and uh so it's nice to see and he's trying to mark is trying to uh i guess every time spence goes to see him for whatever medical reasons, getting his medicine or whatever, he's always trying to pitch him, trying to convince him to watch uh, the movie Interview with a Vampire, which I, f I found to be funny. I haven't watched that movie since it came out, but I've heard, for whatever reason, Interview with a Vampire, culturally, through podcasts and different things, a lot of people have been bringing it up recently. Maybe it's because October's around, I don't know. But it's a movie that I feel like I need to revisit because uh, it's been – I only watched it once, wasn't really a big fan. Uh, but, you know, that was probably 20 years ago, so, I'd you know, I'd like to watch it again. But also, you know, it's cool seeing Mark opening up and, you know, just a good guy. I like Mark. I like all of these characters, really. There's no real character that I dislike in this movie. Definitely characters I like more, like Anya, my favorite. So we find out a little bit more about Spence. Uh, there's a scene where Natsuki is uh, kind of reading out of her notebook a new story, reading a story to her friend, her roommate, who is in the, the recovery room, uh, Tristan, who I don't think we ever meet Tristan at any point, you know, uh, but or we haven't at all, but she's reading to her through the intercom. She's outside of the room. Uh, reading her a story about hitchhikers. And uh, Mark goes in to, to do whatever he needs to do to check on her or whatever, and she asks him to squeeze her hand for her, you know, clearly. And you see in when the Natsuki's room, when the camera's in her room, I think it's when she's getting ready to go, um, waking up to go to club, midnight club, uh, you see in Natsuki's room all of these like bankers boxes that are packed up. So they may be, those may be all of uh, Tristan's stuff packed up. So she might be, not be doing too well. Uh, but we see a little bit of Natsuki in this episode. Reading a new story. Maybe we'll see that story later on. Let's take a little break from the show to promote gift certificates. If you want to purchase artwork for somebody, you have an art lover in your life, and you think they would like my art, but you don't know what painting to get them. I have over 2,000 original pieces of art for sale in my store, along with shirts and 
prints and other things. So I can understand that being a bit daunting if you're trying to buy something for somebody else. Give them the gift certificate and then they can go to my website, inspireddisorder.com, and they can buy whatever paintings they want, they can buy whatever prints they want, they can buy t-shirts, they can buy hats, they can buy all the different merch. Gift certificates, which are available currently at inspireddisorder.com. And now let's get back to the show! Uh, and then, of course, every episode has the kids getting together in, I believe, the library. Again, I didn't. <laughs> it seems like a completely different room when they're in there to, to join together to tell their stories for the Midnight Club. I believe it's the library. It always has the fire going. And uh, we get a new story from one of the kids in every episode. And in this episode, we get a story from the one and only Anya, which I, you know, this is kind of her episode in a lot. We find out a lot of things about Anya in this. So in addition to Anya telling the story, this is also Ilanka's official first night as a member of the Midnight Club. And, uh, of course, they do their chant. To those before to those after, to us now and to those beyond. To those before, to those after, to us now and to those beyond. Seen or unseen, here but not here. Seen or unseen, here but not here. Anya's story is titled The, the Two Danas, which I believe every episode of The Midnight Club the, the name of the episode is the name of the short story that is read or told by the kids. So this episode, The Two Danas, her story about the two Danas, uh, and it's about a girl. And all these stories illuminate something about the person telling it. So we're finding out even more about Anya in some ways. Through her story, we're getting more of Anya's backstory her history uh with obviously some horrific and and different flourishes uh and it's about this girl who's a ballet dancer she's the perfect girl she's a great dancer she's a great student she gets good grades she's a great daughter uh she's a great friend she's she's the perfect girl she's good she does everything right and she's good in every way she's perfect and she, you know, she has a friend, Bill, who's her, her best friend. She so good at dancing. She gets offered a scholarship to go to a dancing school in America. So she moves from Ireland to the U.S. to some boring town. I forget what she names it. It's got to be a fake name, but, you know, it's like uh, Sleepy Town or whatever, where everybody just sleeps their life away. That's not what it's called, but it's kind of a similar thing where it's just kind of you know, boring town, USA. And she goes with her family. Her family kind of sacrifices everything to move to America so that their daughter can go uh, to this ballet school. And all she wants to have is a normal life, right? She's sacrificing her life. She's giving up doing all of the things normal kids do, partying, having fun, eating junk food, because she's gotta have a s strict diet to s stay a certain uh you know health for dancing aesthetic for dancing she's got to get good grades and she's just kind of like she wants to know she wants to experience more out of life and she's praying and one night she's greeted by somebody Another figure with with glowing eyes, so kind of similar to what she saw in the bathroom, like silhouette with glowing eyes. And as it comes forward, it's a woman played by Dr. Dr. Stanton, and she's the devil, right? And she answered because, you know, God never does. You prayed, I answered. That's one guarantee about God is that he never answers. Right. <laughs> Which is, you know, also kind of shows Anya's thoughts on religion and her disillusion with all of that stuff, considering when she first showed up to Brightcliff 
her she used to pray and all this stuff um so yeah so the devil shows up because she's been praying for a normal life and uh you know cut to outside of the story uh spence is like the devil really you know like that's so basic right always one to criticize spence was also the guy who spoke up about the jump scares in episode one right always critical of people's story so it'll be interesting to see what his story is when it comes time for him to see if he jumps into any kind of overused tropes horror tropes uh and then of course uh god what's her name um not sherry uh her name uh sandra the jesus freak of course she's not happy anya gives a little hail satan right and and sandra like oh you should be you shouldn't be doing that stuff uh but then back in the story she's like don't worry it's gonna be good so she gives the hail satan whatever uh and she Satan's got a deal for, right? No no strings attached, right? Not going to ask for your soul afterwards, right? I'm just going to let you have this wish that you want. And she turns Dana into two Danas, right? So there's one, that, and they, they experience the same thing. They share the same thoughts. So as one experiences uh, one type of a life, the other one will experience it and vice versa. They share thoughts, all that stuff. And there's this scene where she like she's looking into a mirror and then you see the the mirror, the reflection in the mirror start to move differently, right? And then from behind the mirror comes uh another Dana. And they freak out, you know, it's like, "Oh, it's kind of like twins almost speaking, you know, there's the little test where they just say words at the same time random thoughts to prove that they are the same they're one in the same uh which is funny that's the one thing with anya not only as a character but also in her story this is very much a comedy horror story there is a lot of comedy in this story which makes complete sense uh so they they choose which one they there's a there's a rave going on they have a little discussion over who gets to go and they decide that dana too should get to go because it doesn't matter they're both going to experience it she tries to give her a pager but it's like whatever you think i think like we don't even need to be talking right now but we're doing it but she gives her the pager anyway and dana too goes to a rave and it's f cut to funny scene where like Dana one is laying in bed studying and she's like head banging, right? Mom comes in, everything okay? Yeah, mom, totally cool. And she's like, and then cut to Dana two at this rave, taking ecstasy, having a lot of fun. Cut to Dana one rolling over in bed. It's like this is fucking amazing. This is the best. This is the best night of studying I've ever had, right? Because she's feeling the same effects of the drug that Dana two took, which instantly presents itself with some serious problems right if you're both experiencing the same thing it doesn't matter uh you're still allowing yourself to make these choices despite not having a, a catch to anything and then dana too after the rave she meets a musician and she he's going somewhere and she's like ah i want to go with you and she just goes with him and then cut to uh another hilarious scene where dana one is it's movie night with her parents and she's talking about how awkward it was to finally lose her virginity so it's dana two losing her virginity to this musician while she dana one is sitting between her parents having an orgasm uh as movie nights going on hilarious scene right hilarious hilarious just situation having like being at movie night sitting between your parents and you're having the the feelings the emotions the 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 energy of what it is to not only lose your virginity but to have an orgasm and then you're you know surrounded by people you do not want to be surrounded by uh so a hilarious situation with the movie night um 
then cut to Dana 1 at ballet. Meanwhile, Dana 2 is kind of picking up a little drug habit. You're seeing her snorting coke, drinking booze, taking pills, like going hard, right? Which is something that happens when you have somebody who's spent their life as a good kid. They've had so much built up pressure to be good, to do good, to succeed for other people when they finally get an opportunity to let go of that they go hard right just as hard as they went trying to be perfect in every other way they can sometimes go hard in that other direction and that's what dana too is doing and because they share everything you're seeing during dana one's ballet practice or whatever it is rehearsal she's not doing good her vision's blurry things aren't doing well and then she it's she breaks her leg right her ankle just like just just it just gives gives way see her screaming meanwhile dana too probably too high to even notice probably taking more drugs to drown out the pain just like a brutal situation clearly has a drug habit things aren't going good uh then dana one back at home kind of nursing her broken leg or ankle whatever happened something very not good happened to it right bent completely away a foot's not supposed to bend and her best friend bill is there and while she's looking at bill she almost starts to like her vision of bill morphs with dana two's vision of this musician she's with with so that kind of blurring makes bill's face look like it's melting freaks her out freaks out dana one she grabs her ballerina statue that's sitting next to her bed and throws it at him breaking the statue and he leaves and she now she wants to get dana two's attention because she's ignoring her she's ignoring the the pager right it's affecting her she can't do anything messed up her leg pushing away her best friend family's not happy with her she's kind of falling off right unable to balance the two right despite them being separate people they're still experiencing both things so in order to get her attention she gets a knife right i need you to get your shit together and she starts cutting herself starts stabbing herself like looking at her hand knowing she's about to stab it dana too is knowing she's about to stab it and then she does and she gets a call from dana too and dana too's like listen i can do this too and then she burns her hand with a lighter not good falling apart literally physically damaging herself metaphorically if you were to think of this story as just something of a single person right having being a, a single person dana as a singular person right anya right maybe this was her story she was a ball she was a ballerina doing well pressure was too much wanted to experience normal life and went down the wrong road and couldn't right the ship right just snowball and trying to get herself together couldn't do it she couldn't get a handle on it right addiction's tough addiction's tough and uh it's hard to once you go down certain paths especially for certain kinds of people it's just it's so difficult to write that ship so clearly she's having a lot of problems her parents ask her to go to rehab she says she will 
friend Bill knows it's bullshit. Right? But she knows she needs to end it, so she steals her dad's gun. She steals the keys to her mom's car, and she drives, and she, Dana, too, knows. Dana, too, knows what she's doing because they share thoughts, and they meet at this one place. And only one can live. Only one can live. They argue over who is first, right? Dana, one's like, you got to die because you're number two. I was here first. And Dana 2's like, what are you talking about? I was here first. Clearly, it's almost impossible to know. I mean, when the story starts, Dana 2 is the one that went out. But still, a lot of drugs. You're sharing memories. Who knows? But they go to shoot. One survives. She wakes up in a hospital. Leg is gone, just like Anya. And the devil shows up, and the devil's sorry. Not sorry about the leg, but sorry that one of them died. And she knows that the other one is in hell because they share feelings. But she doesn't know, the one who survived doesn't know which one it is. Right? We'll never know. And a lot of this story is a beautiful story. Tragic story. Seems like that potentially is Anya's story. That's what Anya's life was. She was into ballet. Maybe did some drugs. Maybe then also cancer. Maybe bone cancer she had. That's why her leg broke. But... A brutal story, a great story by, you know, Anya. And also, from what I heard, I did some reading, that all of these short stories, so the the show itself, The Midnight Club, is based on novels written by Christopher Pike. All of these short stories by all of the kids are based on other novels written by Christopher Pike. So in creating the show, all of the writers, they divvied up all the different books that Christopher Pike wrote, and all of the writers had a job to read and then give book reports on all the different books that he wrote in order to find out which books related to the different characters in the story so that when they told their stories, not only were the stories about another Chris, Christopher Pike book, but also stories that related to the characters themselves, which is beautiful. Like, the amount of work gone into that is amazing and uh, just goes to show how good the writing is and also makes for interesting stories, makes for interesting characters because each of these stories illuminates something about the characters Right, first episode, we hear about uh, Alanka. Obviously, we know specifically the story she told about about uh, Julia Jane is what inspired her to go to Brightcliff in order to get, hopefully, this magical treatment for magic to to have her cancer, which is the same as Julia Jane's go away. Right, that one we know because we saw Alanka pre and in Brightcliff. This story makes so much sense that it is Alanka's story in so many ways. So I, or, uh, Anya's story in so many ways. So I absolutely love this episode. I love Anya as a character. Uh, I you know love all these characters as they're going. We'll see what happens in next episode. Uh, so you're going to have to, to find out what happens in episode three, you're going to have to survive one more week because this is to be continued new episodes of the ray taylor show come out every single day subscribe on youtube and everywhere our podcasts are found binge the full week over at inspired disorder.com slash plus buy ray taylor show merch over at inspired disorder.com and follow the show on instagram at ray taylor show have a wonderful day everybody peace out
much. Today is the day where you wake up and you realize that everything that you've been dreaming about, everything that you've been wanting, every goal and wish and hope that you've ever had can become real. Dreams can come true. What you manifest in your mind, you can bring to reality.